Thank you for joining us here at Kindred Church. I'm so glad that you could spend this time with us as we uh, continue in our discussion of what gives life meaning. And uh, today, um, you know, we're we're looking at this idea of love, which is what we've been talking about for the past, you know, few weeks. And that love is where we find our purpose. And uh, as we get started, I want to share a story of a time when I failed in love, a time where I failed in loving. And it's a a story that has kind of shaped my attitude in a lot of ways. Uh, It was years ago, back when I was the youth minister and we had another preaching minister um, at the church. Uh, It was the Sunday before Christmas. Uh, The preaching minister was out of town, so I was filling in. Uh, but I was foolish enough to schedule a teen Christmas party the night before. Um, and I was just so tired after service uh, that I just wanted to go home. You know, I finished preaching. I had talked to a few people at, immediately afterwards, and I was just ready to go home. But as I was talking to these parents, you know, in the front of the auditorium, I kind of looked towards the back, and there was this man uh, who looked to be probably 50 or maybe early 60s. Uh, looked pretty rough, and was obviously filthy, and once he realized that I saw him, he looked at me in kind of a sheepish way, and it was as if he was saying, can I talk to you, but only using facial expressions. Now, this was, uh, was not the first time a homeless person had come in at the end of service. Uh, they usually were there to ask for money or, or something else. So I, I sat there, and I, I said to myself, Am I, and I'm really ashamed of thinking this way. I want, I want to make sure that that's understood. I'm ashamed of how I felt. This is a story about a time when I failed to love. That's the key to remember. But I said to myself, what a way to end the day. Here's a guy who's obviously just wants money so he can go get high or drunk or probably both. And... Once again, this is a story um, about my attitude and how I failed at love. But this wasn't, this mindset wasn't uh, where the failure ended. Soon he began walking towards me, and when he got within about five feet of me, uh, I could smell him. Um, but I was trying to be polite because that's what my mama taught me to be: is to be polite. So I asked what his name was. He said Michael. Uh, and in my immaturity, I asked, so how long have you been living on the street, Michael? And in his kindness, he answered about six years. And then also from a place of immaturity, I asked where he had been sleeping, and he explained that he had been sleeping in uh, in an abandoned truck over by, in the kind of commercial area of La Mesa, over by the dump. And uh, if I'm being really honest, I was just trying to to keep this conversation short and to send Michael on his way. I really didn't want to hear what he had to say. I just didn't want to have to hear much more about it. So I reached for my wallet uh, because I didn't want to have to bother anybody else. But Michael kind of pushed his hand out in front of me and said, I don't want your money. Uh, What I want is Jesus the Jesus that you were just talking about. Because, Pastor, I know I'm not going to make it. I know that I'm going to die in the street if something doesn't change. And I think Jesus can help me change. That statement cut me deep. Um, I was just going to give him a couple dollars uh, when God had sent this person to me for a reason. Now, I could try and make excuses all day long. Uh, I was tired. There was no doubt about that. That's a pretty good excuse, but not really. Um, There was no excuse for my lack of love. I 
was not seeing this man the way that God saw this man. And I most definitely was not loving this man the way that God loved this man. Now, I had the opportunity to talk with Michael several times after this uh, interaction over the next couple of weeks. I let him use the church shower to get himself cleaned up. Uh, we talked and we studied. Eventually, I even got to baptize Michael. Uh, I even was able to help him reconnect with his sister who lived up in Hemet, uh, which is where I dropped him off, by the way, hopefully to get a, a second chance on life. And unfortunately, uh, stories like this among people are pretty familiar. They happen pretty frequently. We have a tendency to become so full of ourselves um, that in the process we miss opportunities. In the process of being so full of ourselves and what we want to do and our needs and uh, our wants that we miss opportunities to really show the kind of love that Jesus displayed every single day of his life. And like this, this is not anything new though. Uh, let's think about this. Let's think back to the story of Jesus' birth for a moment. Uh, Luke begins by saying, in those days, you know, uh, in those days, uh, things were probably not too different than they are today. Both are shaped by uh, the powers at hand. You know, they had the Roman Empire. We have the U.S. government. Um, but for now, let's, let's focus on the way things were like back then. Luke says, in those days, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All people had to return to their own ancestral lands to register for this census. So if you kind of peel back the layers of that statement, what does this tell us? This was a time that was clearly being shaped by an attitude of just kind of business as usual. Uh, this is the way that they lived then. This is the way that we live now. Uh, their world and our worlds were shaped by authoritative orders, proclamations, uh, accepted power structures, just like we have today. These things shaped and still shape the actions of people uh, everywhere. And think about that phrase for a moment. In those days, you know, even the words, they just kind of sound tired and hopeless. You know, this is the sound of kind of like monotony, right? Uh, but then something happens. Something happened that was not a business-as-usual kind of event. Something extraordinary happened within the time frame of the ordinary. And this something that was extraordinary was something that changed the world forever. God himself entered creation and inaugurated something new. God inaugurated a, a new kind of power. He entered this world not just to be another barrier to keep people out, but rather God entered this world to be a bridge, right? Jesus came to be a bridge that would span the gap that sin had caused between God and humankind. And while he walked with us, he showed us uh, what gives us meaning in life. He showed us where we find our ultimate purpose. Now, sure, Right now, just as it was back in those days, we still have to deal with the drudgery of life in many ways. We still have to pay our taxes, sometimes in ridiculous amounts. Uh, families are still broken by sin. People are still forced to live in homelessness or while others choose it. Many are stuck in dead-end jobs. And at times, we still feel as though everything and everyone is against us. We all have back problems. We have sore muscles. And we, like them, we go to work to deal with our difficult co-workers and even more difficult bosses and bad news. And yet, when God entered creation, something was different. Because within the mess within all the, the hopelessness, 
that life presents, love. Real love had been born. So you can focus on all the worldly things that were going on and still go on today, or you can focus on the fact that real love had been born all those years ago. God had come to rescue us. God had gone from being distant, he had gone from being removed, to being what Isaiah says is God with us. Um, He proved to us that we are not alone, and therefore we can have peace even in the midst of strife, even in the midst of all that hopelessness, even in the midst of uh, all the ugliness of the world, we can have peace. We can have joy in the midst of suffering. We can have faith in the midst of all these troubled times. We can have hope in the midst of hopelessness. We can have love even when everything in our life is trying to make us be more filled with fear. Because love, as James tells us, love drives out fear. Which means that ultimately, God drives out fear through Jesus Christ because God is love. So when God was born into this world, the angel came to the shepherds who were in this field and said, don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid. I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyful news for all people. Love was born this day in Bethlehem. Isn't that incredible? Love, real love, godly love. Jesus Christ was born today in Bethlehem. So yes, in those days, they were governed by fear. And in some ways, we still are governed by fear. Uh, The political powers in both Jesus' day and our own, they play on fear to get their way, whether it's fear of the leadership itself, fear of terrorists, fears of a gunman that might enter your kid's school, fear of uh, seemingly incurable illnesses, and ultimately all that boiling down to fear of death. But with Jesus, there is a new possibility. There was a new reality that entered our world. We no longer needed to be filled with that fear because when God entered this world, we were given the greatest affirmation possible. Jesus told us that we are loved, that love was born that night in Bethlehem, and because love was born, we are loved. We are never alone, that God is on our side, and that because of all of this, your life, because of that love, because of Jesus, your life and my life have meaning. Paul explains it this way to the Romans. In chapter 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Can anything ever separate us from God's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or are in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelmingly, victory is ours through Christ who loved us. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love because of Jesus Christ. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is incredible. That is the love. That is the thing that gives all life meaning and purpose. And to the Corinthian church, Paul explained in chapter 13, that the one thing that counts above all other things in all the creation, is love. Because love never fails. Love will never die. Love will never fade away. Love is our present and our future. And ultimately, love 
is Jesus Christ. But as for the, the, the mundane, as for the hopelessness of the moment that we sometimes feel, when we have those moments when we say, in those days, well, all that stuff is going to come to an end. The, the meaningless, the mundane, the hopelessness, the in do, those days moments, all that stuff is going to come to end. And Paul talks about that. He says in 1 Corinthians 13.10, but when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. So all this stuff that we spend all of our lives focusing on and worrying about, all that's going to come to an end. They're going to be considered useless. Because in the kingdom of God, love is not only an aspiration it is our life. And by embracing the love of Jesus and living that out every day, we can begin living God's eternity, not tomorrow, not in some far-off distant time. We can start living God's eternity right here, right now. After this incredible passage of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says in the next chapter, uh, which is probably part of the same discourse, the same paragraph in the original, Paul says in chapter 14, verse 1, and we're going to end with this verse, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it, because it does. Let me read that again. You, he's talking to you and me, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it, because it does. So what does it mean? And I want you to, to think about this, and feel free to comment in the section below about this. What does it mean for you, personally, you, to go after a life of love? What would it look like in your life to go after, to seek out, that life of love, how would that play out? Think about that. Pray about that. Meditate on how you can do that in your everyday life. That is where we will find meaning and purpose. It's in that seeking out a life of love that we find our purpose in life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. And even though we all have failures, even though we all have these moments where we fail to love, we, one, thank you for forgiving us in our failure, but two, we ask that you help us to go after it, to seek it out, to seek out this life love with everything we have and show it to the people who are in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for spending time with us today. We'll see you soon.